He's a Bassmaster millionaire, a former angler of the year, a two-time Bassmaster winner, a six-time classic qualifier from Newmarket, Minnesota. The amazing fighter man, Seth Fighter, joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. So welcome to Mercer, episode 111. Hard to believe this is episode 111. I mean, the average length of a podcast, the whole length that it lasts, survival rate. You know how long? Seven episodes. So it is amazing that we are here for 111 episodes, but it is only for one reason. That is because of you fine people that meet me here each and every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So um, you're halfway through the week. Welcome in, Humpers. Thank you for making this podcast what it is. And I welcome you in each and every week for our particular brand of tomfoolery that happens here on our channel, which makes this podcast the number one rated podcast on this particular channel. So thank you. Thank you for all of you for making that a possibility. When you think about it, though, what makes the outdoors so special? What makes the sport of fishing, the act of fishing, the, whether you fish for a living, whether you work in the industry, whether you're just a fan of the sport, whether you just love fishing, whether you just However you find yourself here, what makes our community so special is you guys, is the fine people that are part of it. And, and, you know, I look at all the amazing relationships I have with people all around the world because of fishing, because we connect over that. And it's the people that make this sport, this pastime, this passion so special. So I thank you for all of that, for being such amazing people. And um, unfortunately, this week's show is going to start with a bit of a somber note because one of those special people is no longer with us. Um, the Ontario and Canadian fishing industry or world, or I don't know industry, the right word, but the, the Canadian sport fishing world is uh, missing Will Wagman. Will Wegman passed, and Will was a tireless promoter of conservation, a proponent of the sport of fishing, uh, a huge um, crusader for bass and everything conservation. Um, actually received a few awards throughout his life through bass conservation. Will had an incredible impact on the outdoors, and unfortunately, we lost him this week. And I just wanted to take a quick moment and send my thoughts and prayers out to Will Wegman and his family and friends and everybody who is dealing with that hurt right now. Um, and it's weird. I'll be totally transparent and honest as I always am with you guys. There's part of me when I say stuff like this, I don't even know why I'm saying it. I mean, Will's not hearing it. Why are we saying it? And, and sometimes I, I'm almost nervous to say it because you're like, I, I don't want to feel like I'm saying that to attach myself to some kind of sympathy or something. It, it's not. I, but I've really thought about this. And the reason that I'm saying it is this. Will's life mattered. Will made an impact. And that's honestly all we can all hope to do is whatever our chosen root in life is, is to make an impact. And boy, did he make an impact with so many people. Not only did he make an impact, but he made changes for the better that will be felt for years and years to come. So the reason that I wanted to make sure I said something about Will Wagman here to start off this show is to show him the respect that he deserves, but also I hope that some of his family, some of his friends hear this. And they know their friend Will made an impact, made a difference. And I'm thankful for that. 
So our thoughts and prayers go out to Will Wagman, and we thank him for everything that um, that he gave to this sport. <sighs> With that being said, um, they got a great show, an incredible show, an incredible guest. Um, Born of literally the the biggest names in our sport right now. And it's amazing to watch what he has done. I mean, he is literally one of the things that I, you, I mean, if you listen to this show before, you know, I'm always saying, be yourself, whoever yourself is, be that don't be somebody else. He is the epitome, epitome. I think that's the right way to say it. the epitome of being yourself. And from the moment he has been himself, he has been the epitome of success in fishing. The more real he is, the better it seems to get for him. And I'm excited to have him on here this week. And, and I do have to apologize because I will let you know, this podcast is plagued. This particular episode is plagued with some technical difficulties. So we tried to cut around them. And if there's some awkward moments in, in this podcast, well... That's because we kept freezing. I mean, if there's one thing I could change about this podcast, it would be that I could do all of these face-to-face -face with a human being and not have to deal with freezing. Uh, that was my visual effect for those of you watching the visual podcast on YouTube, but not to be held out. Those of you listening to the audio version, I just looked frozen for a split second. It really wasn't that entertaining. But this guy is entertaining. He is a six-time classic qualifier. He is a Bassmaster Angler of the Year. He is a two-time Bassmaster winner, a member of the Bassmaster Millionaires Club from Newmarket, Minnesota, the amazing fighter man, Seth Fighter. Seth Fighter, what's going on with you? Oh, not much. Just got home off a six-week bender of... Uh traveling tournament fishing and turkey hunting and, both uh, successful yeah. yeah had three good tournaments and killed some turkeys and it's all out of the country nice nice so what does it feel like when you're like how do you balance the season i, I mean i always find and i'm just the mc but i always find it's just a nightmare to I always feel like I'm catching up somewhere, whether if I'm at an event, I'm trying to make sure I get everything done that you need to get done at the event. But then you get home and you're like, I got to get a bunch of stuff done. And it just always feels like I'm always on a treadmill and not keeping up. Have you mastered that art? No, I've just come to terms with how it rolls. I just most times if I'm like packing for a tournament or something, I always have this like preconceived notion, you know, it's like, oh, I got a week off and you know, I'm going to like fit down really go through my tackle and i'm like so good at procrastinating it's probably my strongest talent that it just ends up being like 10 o'clock the night i'm or you know i'm gonna leave early in the morning i just throw everything in the truck say fuck it and just figure it out when we get there <laughs> i don't know i don't know that's just how that's that's just how i roll i don't know i've tried other ways i just can't do it yeah I, i'm I'm right there with you. Uh, it, it, it always feels, and when we get a big break, I'm like, man, well, I got so much time. I mean, there is a month before an event, and it never fails. It's, you know, the last yeah. minute. The but, bigger breaks, I think, are worse because you're like, oh, I got time. I got time. I got time. I got time. And then it's like, it'd be better off if you had like a two-day break and you knew you had to do it like tomorrow, you know? I, I agree with that. What what did you think? We were talking about the last event, and I was like, you want to make the Elite Series really exciting? Just have all nine events nine weeks in a row. I'd be into that, but you'd have to, like, it'd have to be a certain time. Of year. Like, if we just did them all up north, like, in oh. June, July, August, that'd be awesome. Yeah. But if you did it down south, it'd just be, like, nine spawn events, probably. Yeah. That's kind of where we've been this year, though. I mean, it, yeah, it feels like much. we've been in the exact same pattern all season. We've, we've literally followed the pattern north. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been a weird spring. We've had probably the most strung-out spawn I've ever seen. Um, 
you know, it, it's been hot and cold and hot and cold and hot and cold. And I, I think some fish started spawning early and all the, all the up and down weather has really strung it out. Like, um, you know, last tournament we went to, that should have been all post spawn. There's still a lot of bed fish caught. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, um, and now, now you get to go to somewhere very predictable. The mm -hmm. Sabine river. <laughs> Where are you with that? You, do you like the Sabine or? I, I do like the Sabine now. The time of year we're going, I don't like the last time we went there in June, like when Hackney won, I don't know what year that was, but that was the hottest weather I've ever experienced in my life. And like, I do not do well in the heat. Like just even the last tournament we were at was too hot for me at Lake Lake. Like that's, and then what was it? 80 degrees. Like it was, it was everyone else. It's like, it's nice out. I'm like, just dripping sweat dying over there yeah last time we went to the sabine it was like 100 degrees 100 percent humidity not a cloud in the sky and not a ripple of wind for a week straight and like the second the sun comes over the trees in the morning oh. it's too hot for me and but other than that I, fishing's not bad there i mean we've been in some places this year that was harder to get a bite than it is to get a bite there you just you know you don't see a lot of four plus pound fish at the Sabine river. But, um, but there's been some practices I've had this year, including the last one that, um, I was thinking to myself, I'll get more bites when I go to the Sabine river. I, I don't, I never imagined that I would be at lay Lake and hear that many people cross the stage and be like, I can't wait to get to orange <laughs> orange where the living is easy. Um, why is it, why do you, why do anglers like it better this time of year though? It seems like they 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 like to come later in the year when it is sweltering hot. Who's that? It ain't me. Not you. So you'd like to see? No, what I'd rather. Let's go there in February. Let's start the year there instead of Florida. You know what I mean? Like that's when I want to go to the Sabine River, not in June. I mean, the fish are biting in June. It's just it's too hot for humans from <laughs> as far north as we are to be outside. I hear you. I hear you. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Uh, the weigh-ins will be, uh, it amazes me that anybody stands in that heat. Like it'll be so like when people are watching an event and just sitting in a chair and sweating, you know, it's too, too hot, but it's, yeah, they're uh, used to, you know, be like us sitting outside in the snow, watching a football game, you know, it's we're fine. Yeah. I don't know that I get that either though. Like, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm I'm soft in both ways. I have. Oh, are you? I think I used no, to be hardy for cold, and uh, the South has beaten that out of me. But I'm still having. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a pansy. I can handle twenty and below. Anything above eighty without a breeze is too much for me. Yeah, yeah. Winning angler of the year. Did it? Do you think it changed you at all? Uh, yeah, for sure. I don't know exactly how, but um not the same person I was, but I think I'm always changing, you know, to some so how, degree evolving. I think that's true. I think that you should, like, I, I, yeah. I think that most people as they age realize that they're, if they don't, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Do you think Matt Robertson thinks he's evolving? I think he's the, doing the opposite of evolving, whatever <laughs> that is. He's going back. Maybe, maybe whatever you call that. I think kids had a lot to do with it too. I think they changed me as much. And I, you know, I had just a couple of kids when I won AOI and I think they got a lot more to do with me changing the win in AOI, but it just kind of coincides with the same timeline. So how have you changed? Uh, I'm an adult. I feel like maybe, <laughs> uh, I do, I do things a bit differently now. I'm not as, uh, I don't know. I feel like I mellowed down a little bit. More and, responsible. And, well, and definitely it, more responsible. And how much of that is the kids and how much of that is angler of the year? Or is it any of it angler of the year? I don't I, I think a little of it is, but mostly the kids, yeah. I just think it happened to coincide with the becoming an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Were you did the season after angler of the, the year? You won in 21, right? Yeah. Did the next season, did you feel less pressure or more? 
more more pressure than I've ever felt. And like really, this year I finally feel in like normal pressure. Yeah, I don't know why. It was all self inflicted, all pressure I put on myself to, I don't know, do it again or whatever. Just not fail miserably and um i don't know i made my year pretty rough but um no this year i I think i'm fishing a bit better i don't know what happened the first couple tournaments but other than that i think i'm like the last tournament i felt like i was fishing like i was in 2021 yeah well i'm making decisions on the fly and adjustments and it made something out of nothing you know what i mean I literally like where I caught all my fish at Lay Lake. I caught one two pounder and shook off a four pounder, and caught a couple of little spots. Like that was my practice. And the last day was kind of really how my tournament should have went, um, but somehow was lucky enough to have that day on day four instead of one or two. You know. Yeah. Do you think that's the biggest difference from the outside when I watch when people have an angler of the year season? It's how fast they fire. It, you know what I mean? Like how fast yeah. the decisions are made. It's it's not a it's not a do you think I should go to that point or not? Like it's yeah. we need to go to that point. Boom, they catch now. We need to go to there. Like yeah. and I've seen I've seen you in that season, but it's it's the heart even pointing it out, it makes it probably harder to duplicate it. But is that the biggest difference as somebody yeah. who experienced it? I think so. And and you just can't do anything wrong. Every decision you're making is right. I mean, Brandon Cobb's having one of them years right now where it's just like, I mean, he's basically top 10 to every tournament we've had, essentially. I think he missed one, but. Yeah, and he was like, much. yeah, it was like 17th or something yeah. in the tournament. So, I mean, he's yeah. never been out of the top 20 all season long. And yeah, and he tells me he's worried because he can't catch smallmouth. But when you're having a year like that, it doesn't matter. Like, he's going to catch smallmouth this year. You know what I mean? It blows me away that he has trouble with smallmouth because, dude, if you watch him fish, he spends a lot of time sight fishing and not just bedding fish, cruising fish. To... I mean, you do that for smallmouth, and generally you do, you do pretty well. Yeah. Well, you just got to throw it like twice as far in front of him. That's about the only difference. But Yeah, that's true. Why do you think southern guys have such a hard time with smallmouth? Um, probably just not enough time doing it. Same reason I suck in Florida and um <laughs> but that that live scope stuff's really tighten that up. I mean you can take guys that have never smallmouth fit like deep smallmouth. Like when we go to St. Clair, you can take guys that have never smallmouth fish before, whether they're from Alabama, Florida, or Japan. And you know, ten years ago they would have struggled and now they might win. Yeah. Well, and we've seen it. I mean, you you have yeah. to cast half the tournament. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the last time we were there, uh, Bill Weidler, and this isn't any shade on him, but I mean, I, I covered him. He cast for half the tournament. I mean, half the tournament, he just rod over his shoulder. And it just, yeah. to me, it was so puzzling because I'm like, how is this happening? Like, how is there a time in this sport that like, it's more effective not to literally be casting um, that arms race for technology that is happening right now. Is that, Frustrating or exciting as a competitor? Um, I'm probably going to sound like a bitter old man just because it's not my strong suit, but I, I feel like it's, I mean, it's double edged. You know, I think you need to stay with the best technology. Those people put a lot of money into us. And I think we need to show the world what their stuff's capable of doing. But at the same time, it's, and this is just a bitter old man take on it just because I want to, you know, flip a jig on a bank and you know what I mean? Not have to do that stuff. Yeah. Like it's, it's kind of taking the fun out of fashion a little bit for me. Um, but that's just a, that's just a bitter old man. Take it. The real answer is I need to get better with live scope. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it's weird. Cause it's the first time it, it seems like to me, it's the first time I'm talking to anglers and they they're concerned about it you know what i mean there was guys in the past that were like well i just don't do that and but now it's like there's people even the people that don't do it have yeah. that whole like yeah but i also have a nightmare that one day i wake up and i don't do this anymore because i don't yeah i don't do oh, that yeah. part of no, the you're game. gonna you're gonna have to get good at it it's just 
one of them things it's not going away and it's only going to become more and more a factor with every year coming and the technology just keeps getting better you know so it's it's a weak part of my game it's something i got to work on but you know sometimes i fantasize about like fishing the bass masters in like 95 where all you had to do is just run up the river and flip a black and blue jig and not worry about anything but uh you know sports evolving it's changing yeah it it um do you, do you hold any grit you know you hear people say well as as people get so good at that the bank you know people st start to pull off that and it'll get better but i mean it just seems like that technology you guys just keep using it shallower and shallower so yeah. i don't know that it's a bank versus offshore thing anymore yeah. no i don't either it's yeah it's getting so good you're gonna be able to see them 100 feet away in six inches of water pretty soon and you know, if every cast you make all day long isn't directly at a bass, you're just not gonna not gonna be able to compete. But uh, like I said, it's just something I gotta get better at and gotta mess with it more. And um I know that, you know, so I know it's something I gotta work on. So when something like that comes along, and this is a big something, I mean, most of the time it's a technique or something like that that you you gotta go figure out. But this is a very big something. So how do you as a professional angler get better? Is that is that does that happen? when you're competing in the off season throughout the entire year like is there specific times you work on that and how do you work on it oh well, all of the above i mean every minute you do it you're gonna get better at it but um you know it's like before we go to st Clair, i'm gonna have to spend a, and the problem is i like even when i go fishing and try to do it i like i give up on it you know what i mean it's like oh, i just want to go flip some grass over there or something you know uh like i need to just sit in my boat for a week and like just do nothing but that you know what i mean force yourself into it before i yeah before i go to st Clair, because i mean that thing's gonna be you know how that's gonna go down i mean yeah dude i i gotta give you credit i mean i've i've said this to you many times you have great foresight in tournaments like of all the anglers i hear stuff from tons of them i mean the first time we went to knoxville I remember you said Gussie's going to win this tournament and literally Gussie won that tournament. But I remember when the last time we were on St. Clair and you said to me before the tournament even started, I was calling you during pre-fish or something, or we met for dinner or something. You said, it's going to be the war of two tournaments, those with forward face and sonar and those without. And dude, it was like, nobody's even that tournament to me. It changed the way you have to cover a bass tournament, like being being behind you'd have to get behind guys and just follow them because nobody was working an edge of anything it was just you're just chasing yeah. fish that lake is going to be dominant why is that lake so important just because it's so, so featureless is that why forward facing is such a big player there yeah it's, and it's flat too which helps seeing you know you're not on real steep drops anywhere everything's flat so you're gonna be able to see a long ways it's deep. You're, that's going to also allow you to see a long ways. And then just the way the fish set up on that lake, it's not like, I mean, that, that deal where I caught on that one year was, that was more like a traditional smallmouth thing, but not like a St. Clair. They're usually just big, giant roaming school. I mean, the school might be a, a half mile square, you know, and they're just kind of two here, two there, three there. And they're all just kind of swimming around cruising on that flat. And, um, you know, without forward facing sonar, you can spend a, a lot of time casting not near a fish and those guys will every cast they make will be at a fish yeah it, it um what do you think the long-term impact on forward facing sonar is on the sport um i mean all critters evolve um i think it's just going to make them more and more boat shy you know like when we first go to, used to go to st Clair, they'd show up under your boat like you'd be drifting around on those flats and look at your 2d and um you'd see a fish under your trolling motor drive to it and catch it and you know now um i think the range that they let you get to them is just gonna keep extending further and further away I, like i'm not that i don't do enough of the scope and to know what that range is and it's gonna be different on every lake um but like the lake st Clair, where they're seeing a lot i'm gonna assume that when you get within 30 40 50 feet of a smallmouth on that lake he's gonna take off and five years from now that might be 100 feet or 120 feet or 150 feet i don't know what the answer is but it's like anything any anything you any wild critter that you're 
trying to manipulate is gonna they evolve and get smarter and smarter you know they adapt yeah exactly what was it like for you watching gussie win the classic it was cool it was really cool um couldn't happen to a better guy and um uh i'm glad it worked out for him just because i knew what he was going through in practice with everybody you know trying to do what he did in the same generally the same area this year he kind of caught him on some different stuff but um yeah i mean that's got to be super frustrating to go to a place and i mean you can't really expect the guys to leave it alone for you you know i mean i did but that's because i'm his friend but um like the way i grew up that spot would have been left alone for him like when i grew up fishing lake when i talk and there was like places i never fished because like this guy you know he'd start there every tournament or like you know this was ted capper's spot that was shane rambling spot like you didn't even check him in practice it was just, yeah i never even fished it never even went there like that was his hole like i'm gonna find something else and fish it you know but now they nowadays people i mean that's what they look for you know what i mean they're watching youtube and past tournaments and not to like see how a guy caught him but to see where he caught him and then go fish there you know what i mean like i i don't have much respect for that i would never do it and you know maybe that's why i don't do as good as i should but um i don't know standing on some moral high ground i guess but i'll be honest and I, i've said a few times i was shocked as many people laid off it as did you know, yeah, I know there no. was people, but, but I, I mean, I, I didn't, I thought there was going to be a handful of guys. You yeah. were one of them that wasn't going to do it, but I was like, those guys, by the end of it, they'll be the, the, the monopoly will be in that area. But it, yeah. it was that just a situation where a good guy, you know, because of the person that Gussie is, if Gussie's a different person, do you think he gets near as much respect showing to oh, him? Oh yeah, no, it definitely has a lot to do with who he was, but. You're right, though. I thought I figured 30 boats would have started there in the tournament. And uh, it, it only ended up being, you know, a handful. So I don't know if them guys tried it and couldn't catch them or, or what the deal was. But no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Does that was, have I, I thought half the field would have started there, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. I, that's what I thought. Um, does uh, Does that happen if we go there again? Or do you uh, think Gussie, it's just like Gussie, screw off. You've got enough. Well, at this point, yeah, at this point, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, yeah, he, he's, I mean, he's won $400,000 out of that canal on a classic trophy. Like, I think he should be okay with it at this point, too. Yeah, you would. Like, think. he should just go largemouth fish. <laughs> just let, let the rest of the hounds pull at the scraps, you know? <laughs> that, uh, did it affect you in any different way just because of who Gussie is to you? Like, I, I mean, I would just think like he's one of your guys, like they, they're all people you compete against, but to watch Gussie win it. And that's, I know you guys aren't rooming together right now, but you guys have been roommates for most of the time he was here oh, on yeah. the elite series. I would have, I mean, even for me, knowing Gussie, as long as I did to watch him win was different. It was just like, wow, that's, like watching one of the guys win it this week, yeah. you know, like, oh, yeah. yeah, if it wasn't me, I'd, you know, if I was going to pick anyone else to win it, it'd be him, you know? Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was a, uh, pretty incredible event and, and it's, and now, now guess he gets to go in for lunch and stuff on pre-fish. I saw at the last event, he yeah. went in and had, had lunch. So winning he's big things the changes <laughs> the next year, I guess, like yeah. he's proved and you've proved what's, uh, what drives you now, dude? I mean, like you, I would say that this Seth fighter is a lot different. Like I look at in the time I've known you, it's amazing how you've gone from being this quiet rookie that, you know, at one point wasn't making on the elite series to one of the most marketable, one of the biggest fan bases. Like it's you, I know you don't say it for yourself, but you know, the amount of people that are out there cheering for you, it's amazing. And I talk to people like, and I hope they don't jump on me for saying this, but I'll talk to people like wired to fish and I'll be like, who's your needle movers, dude, you're there. Like, I mean, there's like three names they give and yours is one of them. And usually it's the top of the list. And, and that's a place that's shooting video with everybody from every league and everything like that. Your freaking career has changed a lot in the short time we've known each other. Yeah. 
but I, I think with the like the wired fish stuff just not being completely full of shit like makes a big difference with that stuff you know what i mean like some of these guys will just try to sell you like the most awful terrible stuff they know deep down in their heart isn't gonna work and um you know i i just try to push the stuff i know works like because i've caught fish on it and it's stuff i use versus you know like all the companies i work with they all make a million baits you know i'm not going to tell you every single one of them's great like here's the four or five i really like or two or three or whatever it may be or one what it i don't know um that i really like that i use this is how i use them and yeah they make 50 different baits I, i'm not going to talk about 45 of them because i don't yeah i don't have any confidence in them they i'm sure you know anything can be a fish can be caught on anything but i have no confidence in them so i'm not going to try to convince you that you should you know have you ever had that uncomfortable conversation with you know a partner that's like hey why aren't you showing this a little love and you don't need to give the partner out obviously but have you ever been asked we'd really love you to give this a little more love and it's not a product that you believe in well yeah at this point i can i mean i'm all the people i work with them i'd consider friends at this point not just a business yeah. relationship and I can tell them straight up, like, that thing's a piece of shit. I'm not talking about it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's a good position to be in, though. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'll double, triple pump the stuff I like, but, like, I, if I don't like it, I don't want to talk about it. I don't know. I mean, I think that that's wise. I mean, I, 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 well, think, I, think, for... I think it helps, like, within my ability to, like, sell stuff through Wired to Fish, because then when people see videos of mine they you know they have some trust in me and not i'm not just used car salesman on everything we got you know <laughs> is there a lot of used car salesmen on the elite series you think yeah for sure <laughs> well not as much as there, not as many as there used to be the old crew is a uh, way worse about it is there part of you that feels for some of the younger guys though? Like I, I look at some of the deals you see younger guys that are kind of forced to take because there's yeah. that, there's this oh, yeah. no dream doubt. that exists out there. People seem to think you make the elite series and that's easy. Well, I've always explained to people it's like this. It's like, do you remember what grade school was like? You know, grade three and grade four was okay, but grade seven and eight was awesome. Right. And grade seven and eight, you were the cool kids in the school. You were the biggest kids. Even if you weren't the cool kids, you were the bigger kids and, and then you went to high school in grade nine and <laughs> how much that sucked all of a sudden yeah. that's the elite series. Like you, you work your way through the opens and you're like, wow, I'm on top of the open leaderboard. And then you come to the elite series and it's like, boom, boom, you're shoved yeah. in a locker <laughs> and you're like, what am I doing in this locker? <laughs> I thought I was going to get all sorts of sponsors. Yeah. It, do you feel like it's a tough situation for a lot of those guys yeah. They have to take whatever deal they can get. Yeah, and I don't blame them. I'm not trying to talk bad about them or anything like that. I was in their shoes too. And um, yeah, at that stage in the game, you have to if somebody if a company's willing to throw you some dough, you got to do what you can to get it. You know what I mean? And if that's taking dirty deals, it is what it is. But then, you know, hopefully you can get above that and then part ways with them and get where you want to be, you know. But yeah, yeah, you do what you you do what you gotta do. This is it's a business. There's nothing you can do about it, but fortunate enough for me, I, I got to start with some really good companies and then, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to stay with them. So, but I don't, I don't, I mean, if you want to take a deal with X, Y, Z junkie bait company, <laughs> take it. You know what I mean? If that's all, if that's your only option, take it. Are you like the last of the Mohicans or whatever, when I look at you, I'm looking at all the pros that are coming and I'm like, your generation, you and the Gussies and people like that, you guys are like the last group that isn't college driven. Yeah, and oh, yeah. it, it's so rare now. Like, I mean, David Gaston, I guess is one and obviously Will Davis, but there's very few people that don't like just come with this resume from collegiate fishing and high school fishing. And are you, is it a changing time? Is that how you have to make, like, if, if you were to do it again today, if you were X amount of years younger, what is that where you'd have to go through college? Do you think, or, or can you still make it the old fashioned way? 
you can still make it the old fashioned way. They made it a lot harder though. Um, with having to do the nine opens instead of the three. I don't really agree with that, but, um, I think you kind of took the working man out of it now. Really? Now I think absolutely. Like I would have never, I wouldn't be here right now. If you had to fish nine opens, not a chance. But like, don't I would you... never, I would never had a chance to dance. And I understand their point. They like, these guys were coming in, fishing three opens, qualifying for the elites, getting in over their head, going bankrupt in two years and getting kicked out. But at least he had a chance to dance. You know what I mean? Now he never doesn't even have a chance. He's got one little shot through the nation or whatever. But um, I mean, now the only people you're going to see qualify for the elite series at this point are XFLW guys, which are pretty much already established professional fishermen. And then, you know, college kids with rich parents. I mean, that that's who's coming through the opens now, for the most part. Not all of them. I mean, you're still going to have a couple working class guys, but I, I think it took the majority of those guys out of it. Um, I'd like to see it change, like to see it go back. I, I understand what they're doing. They were trying to protect a guy from going bankrupt. But, I mean, if you go bankrupt chasing your dream, what, that's way better than blowing it all on a – Super Bowl bet, bet at Vegas, you know what I mean? <laughs> at least you got to fish on the Elite Series for two years, and you'll always have that, you know? You get to chase the dream. Right? Yeah. Just not being able to do all nine opens, you know? I agree with you to a certain extent, but I also just think, like, you, we were also burning through some really talented anglers. Anglers would come and prematurely make the Elite Series, and let's just say... I mean, everybody knows there's anglers come along. You see some of the most incredible anglers in the sport take a few years to figure it out. And it, you talked you talked at the beginning of this chat about maturing and stuff like that. If they get it too early, you get anglers that come and they're just not ready yet, and they'll never come back because they get whooped and they leave with a stack of credit card bills and they well, spend. At least he had a chance. Yeah. He had a chance to play, and it could have worked out. Look at me. I, I made it probably a year or two before I should have, and here we are. Yeah. No, I agree with you there. I agree with you there. It, it, it um, does, does I mean, the fact definitely... that 175 people signed up for all nine nuts skew you to think that there's enough people that are trying to chase it? Or There's, there's enough. I'm just saying I, my personal story, I wouldn't be here if I had yeah. all nine of them. But, dude, that's one of the things I think that that's what you just did right there is why I think like and it's part of your point when you said you tell the truth or what you feel to be the truth. Whether it be Bates or whatever, that's why there's so many people that cheer for you, because there's so many people that would be in your situation. And not look back and be like, well, I wouldn't be here if it was nine events. They'd be like, well, I am here now. But you, you still see it through the same eyes you saw it from originally. Where did that come from? Is that like is that how your parents raised you? Have you always I mean your your way to see things has always been fairly clear from what I've seen? Uh, I think it's just a I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a great answer for it. Just a I got a super low tolerance for bullshit and uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. One of your most famous things was being one of the early committers to stay with bass in one of the most legendary videos. How did you know? Uh, I'm not going to say I didn't think about going the other route, but it, it yeah. was red flag stuff. Kind of like what we were talking about earlier before we were on air. It's just, it just started adding up, you know, I was like, no, oh, that doesn't seem like a good idea. That doesn't seem like a good idea. And on and on and on and on. And then, um, Another thing with the way them opens are getting, they're so nasty to fish anymore. Like I didn't want to go back through that. Didn't which I know where I, that's I knew where I'd end up being if I took that route. So, um, and like yeah, I mean, if you're going to fish an organization ran by Boyd Duckett. Like, really? That's your savior. Hey, like, Boyd you have, just got you have, a big penalty. You have faith in that. Boyd recently got a big penalty for pre-fishing out of when you're not supposed to be pre-fishing. They gave him 10 minutes at the dock. So 
Oh, did they actually tell somebody about it? I don't know. I don't know. There was another know. tournament they just had at Murray, and they're one of their big name guys only got to fish the third period or something. What? They, yeah, they didn't tell anybody about it. It's okay. We'll talk about other stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll we'll move you on. Get, you can get one of them guys on your show, and they can tell you all about it. No, dude, I've honestly tried to avoid that just because I okay. think that there's a, it's in the podcast world. It's way too easy to go there. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I try to have honest conversations. I mean, we just about went down that road. Let's... No, no, I know. But you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to title this Seth fighter, why he made the right decision or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it, it's not going to be about that just because I, I feel like feel like the the industry has enough like there's enough people chasing ambulances right now i just feel like, like like look at every little thing that happens where there's a dq or there's a controversy it's like the big it gets the biggest pop oh, out yeah. of anything oh, yeah. and i i just i don't know personally i just don't think i think if you put that much negativity into the world that, that it's going to end up back in your lap at some point that's yeah. that's why what my take on that stuff is yeah. on the better stuff okay better stuff let's talk about your roommates they're always fun <laughs> they are uh, now that grow and gussie are gone who did who the hell does who's the responsible person in your group uh chris's girlfriend oh <laughs> yeah she's awesome so she's she, the responsible she, one she books the places and She's actually not coming to Sabine, but she's come. She showed. She started showing up at the end of last year, and she's been at all the ones this year with the Sabine, which we haven't gone to yet. But no, it's been nice having her there. So you guys didn't have to find have to. dinners. Wow, yeah, takes care of us. Yeah, wow, fix the place up because we're all just a bunch of procrastinators. <laughs> I mean, between the res the responsible ones, it's between Chris and Matt. Um, as far as like getting places booked and stuff like that. So Chris and Matt well, are your responsible ones. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, me and Corey are absolutely worthless. And <laughs> um yeah, I don't know. So thank God for Chris's girlfriend. Has has Matt started to change at all room with you guys? Like or is he still yeah. Oh, he's changing a lot, but he's going like it's changing into like twenty year old Matt Robinson Matt Robertson <laughs> instead of like a older, wiser Matt Robertson. What he did in two events this year, I mean not the last event, but the two before that to lead the beginning of, did he go into those events feeling like he was, you know, on the kind of fish to lead, or did he just what was happening um, in those events? I think Santee was decent. No, uh, Murray, I think. I don't, I don't think he had any anticipation of that. Um, I think, yeah, he, and I know he knows he got lucky and that first day and, um, you know, kind of made the best of it. But uh, Santee, he was on, he was, he was getting some decent bites there. So, yeah. And then, then he stopped swearing. <laughs> Ironically enough, he, he stopped swearing and then he stopped catching him. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I should talk, publicly talk about this pattern, yeah, but nah, it does seem he's like doing better when he's getting in trouble. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, I asked you this a little while ago, and then we got off on another. What drives you? Like, what is your ultimate goal in this sport at this point? Um. Honestly, I'm just trying to. I mean, there's some titles I still want, you know, like I, I have to win a Bassmaster Classic before I, before this is over. And I'd like to win a couple blue trophies in between there. Um, and then honestly, I really just want to move my kids out of town, out to a nice little place out in the country. And um, yeah, as soon as I get enough money for that, I, I don't know. Tell well, me this. Probably get the hell out of here. Like how far from where you're at? I'm not that far. I just like I live in a cul-de-sac, like in a housing development, and like you know, whatever. How many weirdos there are out there this day? Like, you know what I mean? Like my kids can't go outside without me. 
You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I'd Long like to be. Space. Yeah. Like, they should be able to go out in the backyard and play. And I just, you know what I mean? I shouldn't have to be like that attentive over watching them. You know what I mean? Or, well, you, you know what I'm saying? I shouldn't have to be like hovering over them. You should be able to open the door, let them run out there. And then, you know, just listen for screaming and then go if somebody gets hurt, you know? <laughs> like, I shouldn't have to be standing over them like a hawk because some weirdo yeah. might roll through and either hit a kid with a car or kidnap them or whatever may happen. You know what I mean? I just I want a little piece of ground off the main road where I can, you know? Is this something you're actively run. looking for now, or or is yeah, I mean, I need some more money, but yeah, I mean, I've been looking. I just, I gotta win some more, win a couple more derbies or something. I get the kids out in the country and, uh, yeah, hit, get a little hit, piece hit. of heaven. Nice. I want that yeah. to happen. Raise for some you. chickens. Have some. I don't know. Maybe a pet, a turkey, pet ducks. And, yeah. And a couple of German shepherds and let them all run free. That's heaven for you. That's your dream. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a pretty good dream. I mean, so is is the farm like the chickens and stuff just for you? Like you're not raising chickens and selling eggs and stuff, right? You're just, just for the family, I would assume. Death Fighter has left the building. Hello. As soon as he started talking bad about his neighborhood, the Wi Fi shut down. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> hey, are you back? What the hell happened? Where are you? Can't hear you. It says, you. Can you hear me now? I got you now. It says my internet connection is unstable. Oh, you're unstable. <laughs> you're back now then. We'll just have to okay. cut that section out of the <laughs> podcast. Well, imagine that didn't that happen. That two-minute dead zone. <laughs> well, you had a great facial expression. You were sitting there like this. Nice. Um, Minnesota. Tell me this, Minnesota is an amazing state, incredibly blessed with amazing resources, fisheries. And... But when you look at how good the fishing is, there isn't a long history of tournament, top tournament pros coming from Minnesota. But there is an inordinate amount of people from the state of Minnesota that work in fishing TV. If you look at all the different, whether it be, you know, wired to fish, whether it be in fishermen, whether it be the linders, angling edge, there's so many different things, you know, that have come from Minnesota. Do you think that because the linders were as successful as they were while you guys were all growing up, that it drove so many people that wanted to make a living in pro fishing towards TV rather than tournaments oh uh, i don't i don't know that there's definitely like it's a big fishing state like even yeah. aside from tv and stuff like companies like rapple and a handful of other ones um a lot of the fishing industry is big in Minnesota, all around every aspect of it from you know manufacturing to tournament fishing tv all that stuff in between I mean, I think that's just a lot of that has to do with how good the resources are here. You know, it's the lenders moved here for a reason. You know, they came out of Chicago and they go up to northern Minnesota and it's like, hell, you can film a TV show in 27 <laughs> minutes up here. <laughs> like we can get some stuff done. The, the, the resources, I think, dictate it, came, you know, have a lot to do with that. A lot of the reason why the some manufacturers are out of here and. I mean, you can even throw Berkeley in there. I mean, they're in Iowa, but they're 20 minutes from the Minnesota border. You know what I mean? Uh, Rappel and, and Bagley's is out of here now. Quite a few companies. But, um, yeah, I think that has a lot to do with the resources. And then um, I think the resources also had to do with the um, 
I don't know the word I'm looking for. Uh, just the traditions and stuff of Minnesota. It was, it's a very heavily outdoors based state, whether it's hunting or fishing, like when deer season opens, like half the state is in a deer stand when it's yeah. fishing opener, half the state's on the water fishing. You know what I mean? It's, I don't think you see that a lot of other places. I mean, I'm not saying our, and we have so much of it to go around. It's not like, you know, there's a lot of past fishermen in Alabama, but you know, you can name all their lakes. You know what I mean? Like, so, so you're going to you... Gunnersville or you're going to Lay Lake. It's like you're going fishing on a lake in Minnesota. I mean, you can name a, hundreds of them. I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. So does coming from somewhere like that make it easier or harder to be a bass pro? When you think about it, like you're going to catch a bunch of fish, yeah. but you're it's also a... not going to have a – like. It, you leave that state and you're like, well, what the lake's broken. I haven't caught 10 in the first hour. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a double edged sword. Um, you get a lot of bites, which is nice. Like if you wanted to, let's pretend it's 2000 and you've never thrown a drop shot before and you want to figure out drop shot and you can go out and catch 50 fish the first day you ever pick up a drop shot, which helps you get some confidence and it helps you learn the little nuances of it um like i said it's a double-edged sword we're fishing for stupid fish they're easy to catch and then when you go to places you know like especially now i'm used to it because i've been to a bunch of grinders but like early in my career you go to a place it's like uh you know whatever even lay lake was tough for me you go out and have a practice where you get two three bites in a day and they're all one up lake down lake one mid lake all three on different baits like that blows your mind like you know, usually when I fish a little lake in Minnesota, I drop the boat and put the trolling motor down and just start going down the bank. You know what I mean? Like, and you're just going to start catching fish immediately. <laughs> um, so there, it's a double edged sword, but I will say you, it's easy to learn techniques, new techniques in, you know, Minnesota or the north um, versus it is down south, you know, on a place where when you're doing everything right, like you're as dialed as you can be, you might only get six, seven bites a day. You know what I mean? It's hard to learn when um you know you're fishing places like that but you get better at catching smart fish too you know yeah yeah what what is the hardest thing for you to what has been the hardest thing for you to learn throughout your career um i i mean just looking at past results florida for some reason i struggle i don't know why um and then tidal rivers really throw me for a loop just because i, I the fact you can fish like the winning spot like two hours too early or two hours too late and not get a bite not like oh i caught a couple there and then you yeah. go there and it's on fire like not get a bite like that that drives me nuts but um i think i'm getting slightly better at both but they're, they're still by far my weakest points the the title thing i get florida though I would think that you like grass too much for it not to fish well for you. Look, why does Florida, is there just too much of it? Like you can't isolate an area? No, I don't say that. I think, I think a lot of the times we go to Florida, it fishes really small and I hate fishing in a crowd more than anything. Like I can't stand fishing in a crowd. Like, and I try to get away from it and there's just no fish anywhere else. Like Okeechobee was really frustrating for me. Cause like I was fishing in a crowded area, but I was trying to like kind of outskirt them. Yeah. And like every time I'd get close to them, I'd catch a fish and then I'd slide way back off trying to do something else and just go an hour without catching a fish. And I'd get kind of close to the boats again and I'd catch a fish and like, I don't know, maybe it's just a pride thing or I don't know what it is, but like I literally should have sat right in the middle of them throwing the exact same bait that everyone else was throwing and I would have cashed a check. Like it's dumb. So why why won't you do that? I don't know. I can't stand it. I hate it. I hate it, man. Like, like what does it feel like? Like, like what 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 like it feels like you're oh, cheating? Like, what? It, no, to, like I'm embarrassed to be there. I don't know. Like, um, <laughs> it, it must be a pride thing. Like to be in an, you know what I mean? Like you saw that stuff was at Okeechobee, all the way across Lake Okeechobee. You don't see a boat anywhere. 
and you drive it back into these cattails and there's 30 boats in a little five acre area clearly that's where all the bass are but like it hurts my soul and it is embarrassing and um like i'm calling myself names as i'm like getting closer <laughs> to this group of boats <laughs> like i would, would hate for anyone to even see me do it you know what i mean like, wow I, but that's how i grew up you know like i grew up in minnesota there's fish everywhere if you fish next to somebody in minnesota you're an absolute punk dude like there's another really good spot a hundred yards away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's not like some of these places we go and it's like, Oh, there's three places. If you would like to catch a bass in this tournament, you better fish one of these three places or you're going to blank. Um, so I think that that might have a lot to do with it, but like, yeah, I cannot stand fishing by people. Do the, do the rules of a community honey hole change depending on where you're at? Because it does feel like there's certain fisheries we go to and people are like, well, you're just going to have people beside you. That's just how it is here. Yeah. Same reason I don't like ledge tournaments and, and it's different, like a ledge term. If it's one guy and you guys are working together, that's one thing. But like Okeechobee was almost like a small, great, like small mouth tournament. Yeah. kind of how it was. It was like just just herds of boats you know what i mean it wasn't like oh there's a couple guys in that zone i'm you know whatever it might be the third guy we're okay a sea of boats like i mean almost casting distance from each other the whole time and that's like kind of what it felt like kind of like a you know you see that sometimes on the great lakes um and just like i want absolutely no part of that so outside of feeling like it's just not where you do you not like fishing with groups because you don't like hearing what's going on or, or is it all just like, you don't like, you want to be on your own thing. Yeah, I don't like any bit of it, dude. I don't want to see you catch one. I don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, I don't like, if I want to go, I, I feel trapped. Like, you know what I mean? Like you kind of got to like move in unison. You know what I mean? Like if I want to take a hard 90 degree left, I can't because there's a boat there, you know, like I have to like, <laughs> weasel, you know, meander through the crowd like i can't do what i want i feel imprisoned i get that i, mean, I, can, I, I can leave but then when i do leave i don't catch any fish so it's like damned if you do damned if you don't and you're also going to gonna find out what that. happened afterwards too like you leaving if you leave and it's just you uh, you don't have to go to the troughs afterwards and see all these guys with 25 pounds and be like yeah. oh you left an hour early yeah or five minutes yeah as soon as you left, we all started catching them. I guess we. That's cool. <laughs> what What is it like in those troughs back there? Because to me, it seems like a whole other world. Because it's like I work for bass. It's the one part of bass that I never see. I get to see like the first five people that li line up, but I do hear like a lot of chatter back there, and I know when there's like some big stuff coming because you hear all the guys react. Yeah. But I feel like that's its own little world back there. It is. It's a cool spot. It's a lot of a lot of the one that got away stories that flying around back there, which is, I mean, I can't say I haven't told them, but um, yeah, it's it, it's cool. You know, everybody's kind of the day's over, the the swords are put away, and um, you're kind of friends. Let you know, let somebody cry on your shoulder because next tournament you'll be crying on theirs. Talking about the eight pounder you lost or whatever <laughs> BS number you want to throw at a fish that no one has any proof of how big it could ever possibly be. <laughs> I mean, people lose a lot of fish. There's a lot of fish lost. Always um, big though, aren't they? <laughs> never ever does somebody be like the little ones kept getting off. Why yeah. is that? Why do little know. fish never get off? I don't know. I've asked myself that same question a lot and I never get a good answer. Do you have fish that you've lost during a tournament that are like seared into your brain? Like that you remember every detail of that fish to this day? Uh, a couple of them, you know, honestly, the worst, the worst one, it wasn't even a lost fish. It was, it was at Champlain. Um, I just caught that like six pounder under that dock. I was freaking out. I don't know. So saw the clip or whatever um yeah. so i had a really good bag it was like day two or day three of the tournament i had over 20 pounds and um 
I went pre-fishing after that to find some more little grass patches or something. And I mean, I flipped a lot of grass and I like give my head, I can kind of tell how big they are when I'm shaking them off. And I shook off one that in my head was a, a big one. Yeah. To go, try to go back and catch them the next day. Cause my smallest fish is, I don't know, three and a half pounds or something at that point. Um, and I, yeah, I shook them off during the tournament, the middle of the day on day two or three or whatever it was. And, uh, that one really bugs me because I don't think I lost by that much. And, uh, of course, you know, I went back there the next day, no bite to be had, but was, you know, sometimes that's worked out before, but that's the first fish I ever shook off in a tournament. I'll never do that again. Um, and then I lost one on the California Delta that I'll never forget on a spinning pole. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to call him a nine pounder, whatever, plus or minus, whatever you want to call it. Um, hooked him on a spinning rod on a wacky worm. I was in one of them little ditches or whatever. And there was like one clump of like viney stuff out in the middle. He rips off, like I'm chasing the thing. He rips off like 40 yards of drag swims right into that clump. I can still feel him like ticking on it when I get up to it. And I like go to reach in there and I can see my wacky worm hook just stuck in the vine. And I see this bass, like, I don't even know, whatever, oh. like a nine pounder comes swimming out of that little clump, like popping his jaw like you know stretching out his mouth swimming away and that one oh. was, that one hurt it was bad like i wish i'd have never seen him but yeah it's amazing though think of how many fish over the years have been shooken off not just in the tournament, the tournament. like the one you talked about but think of how yeah. many like if you took all the tournament anglers how many freaking five pounders have been let to swim because in hopes that i'll get you tomorrow <laughs> like well, another one I really regret when we were at the Neely Henry. It was the last day of practice. Um, I've never caught any really big spotted bass, maybe four pounds, the biggest one I ever caught. I had one that was, I don't know, whatever. I seen him in the waters. I'm a suit. I'm going to call him a five plus pound spotted bass. Eat my swim jig like 10 feet from the boat and I shook him off, of course. And I really wish I would have cracked him because I never saw that fish ever again. Ugh. That probably been the biggest spot of bass I ever caught. And on a swim jig to boot, you know what I mean? It's not like I caught it on a drop shot on Lanier in 40 feet of water, like water willow, straight braid, <laughs> six inches under the surface, a five pound spot. It's my swim jig. I wish I could have cracked his ass. But <clears throat> yeah, they, aren't, they aren't near as tough on that kind of equipment that they are as on a drop shot. <laughs> I bet you'd have your hands full. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. It, uh, what's the best thing at this point as an established elite series pro? I mean, this is your career. I, I feel that you have to be in that point of your life where yeah. you're like, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be a pro fisherman. I'm going to work my butt off and make my mark in the sport. Yeah. But what is the coolest part of the job? Like, what is the part where you like, after a six week stretch where you've been on the road that you look back and man, that, that was, that was awesome. Just catching bigs and tournaments. I guess the best part of all of this. Yeah. Like when it matters, I don't know. That's the same reason we've always done this. It's the, that's the joy of the tournament. I mean, some people like to weigh in and stuff like that, but you both flip a five pounder in a, on Derby day. Like that don't, it's, and uh, hey, every every day of the tournament that progresses, that feeling becomes, you know what I mean? It doesn't feel the same on day one as it does on day four, you know? Like, I don't know, catching them in a tournament is just the, I don't know, I think it's the best feeling. The way in's cool, but there's nothing, Not nothing compares to that moment that thing comes over the rail and hits the bottom of the boat and he's, you got him, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's That's the best feeling there is. It, it's like taking something you really love. I mean, everybody loves to bass fish, and but you put it on steroids. Like that is literally, that's what tournament fishing is. Like if you have never tournament fished, like think of the highest high you had when you caught the biggest fish and you were freaking out. But now it feels like, and, and you can relive it. You know what I mean? That moment and like, like for your prime example of somebody that, I mean, we've hung out a lot 
at this point. I've seen a lot of different sides of Seth Fighter, but there's a side of you that I don't ever see ever unless it's when you're in that, you know what I mean? When you like truly yeah. lose it and freak out. Yeah. I mean, that's not, you're, you're not sitting, you're not driving to a tournament thinking, well, if I get one, I'm going to pump them in and do yeah. this or that. It's just stuff starts coming out of your mouth. Yeah. And you don't even know you're like you're yeah. possessed for a brief moment in time. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's better than any drug out there. Yeah. <laughs> I've never done heroin, but I bet you that's pretty close. <laughs> It's a great, great quote. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, it, it's a very addictive feeling. Uh, well, what is your greatest fish catch in a tournament? Do you think? Like, what's the one that you look back and you're like, man, that was. I mean, you're always trying to top it, obviously, but. Um. I don't know. I remember the lost ones and the stupid stuff I did more than the ones I caught, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. ones you catch, they're all part of the plan. You, know, you can't really single one out. Even the couple times I won, it's never been like that fish was the one that won it. You know what I mean? It's all 15 or 20 of them matter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, does it change for you whether it's a... Um, I mean, yeah, once it... more so once it got away. I try to have like a natural conversation, but it's pretty tough when you keep pausing and and I don't know if you hear me and I hear you. I don't know why we're having so many hard times. Um, I, I think it needs to be a little awkward. It needs to be awkward. You like the awkward? I do. Yeah. Zona loves the awkward. Is it is awkward? Is, is that where you guys have become tight that you both excel in the awkward? I think so. Yeah. The uncomfortableness really brings really brings it together i think what's the most uncomfortable you've ever been at a bassmaster tournament you wanted to go there i know i know, I know the worst i've ever felt at one was the uh, my first day on the elite series we started at sabine river and i blanked yeah that's painful didn't even get to weigh in yeah that was that was yeah it was Bad first day. I don't know if it was uncomfortable, but it hurt my soul. I know that. Yeah. 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 Especially that one. I mean, it's your first one. I mean, that's also evil to start. Oh, yeah. What, what year did you Especially start? When what you year know did we start on the Sabine? <laughs> well, my rookie year was 15-ish. Okay. I think it was 15. So on, uh, I, don't know. I think Chris Lane won. It was the one where oh, they flooded. Team like, drain. The remember? Oh, yeah. I remember on the, bat, the last day, we got a bunch of rain. Or, like, I wasn't fishing anymore. But, like, on day four, there's a bunch of rain. Yeah. And, like, the biffies were underwater and stuff. Yeah. 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 That's evil. Nobody should start their career in orange. Well, come to the Elite Series. Let's go work. Yeah, really never hard. been there before it is. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, I think it'll be good this time around. I'm hoping. Anyways, I, no, I mean, I think the fishing will be good. Why is it better this time of year? Does it spread out? Uh, I don't know. I just seem to get more bites. I guess I'm only basing this off the other time I was there in June, but it seemed like I got more bites than, than I had previous years going there early. I don't, I don't know why. But, yeah, I do think they spread out. They get out of the little dead-end canals and kind of. You can kind of catch them all different over ways. instead of in like yeah, a couple little tiny zones. Yeah, yeah. No, it it uh, we'll see what it is. I mean, it'll be giant crowds again. It'll be a big yeah. festival of bass fishing. And here's the weird thing. I mean, every year we go there, and and there's times where I go and I'm like, ah, I don't know. I mean, it's such a weird fishery, but it always makes a compelling story. I mean, watching Christy try to balances gas to win last time and just all there's lee livesey dodged dead cows I mean, where could you go to a fishery where people are dodging dead cows and trying to figure out their gas like they're on mad max no that's a it's a wild place but at the same time like any any one of us 100 could win like you can't say that about any other place we go it's true it's true we literally anyone 
could win that tournament. You're right. You're right. Who uh, who who would you be picking if you couldn't pick yourself? Uh, I know who I'd pick, but I'd rather not say. Oh. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. That'll make not a fan of the feller, but I think he'll. Oh. He'll he'll have, he'll have his first good elite series tournament. Take that whatever direction you want to go with that. Yeah. I told you we're trying to be positive here, Seth. <laughs> oh, keep dragging me down these dark I, holes, man. Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to evolve. <laughs> Normally I'd sit here and talk shit to everybody with the all night long, but I'm, I'm trying to do better, Dave. I'm trying to be better. <laughs> well, you know I'll talk some shit. I know you will. I know you will. Dude, okay. Well, we're on that dude does cheating happen in bass terms. Absolutely, to some extent. The problem is that cheaters don't feel the wrath. I'm talking about all circuits, not just bass masters. But I think the most of the cheating that happens is almost unpoliceable and it's not happening during the day of the tournament. You know what I mean? It's it's with information being exchanged prior to the tournament. And it's really hard to police that. But that being said, I think when someone does get caught doing something like that, they, I mean, they need to be, depending on what kind of penalty it was, you know, obviously if you didn't hook up your kill switch and you, uh, you know, drove to a spot, like I have no problem with that. There's no, that's not cheating. Advantage. Yeah. Well, that's, that's against a rules, rules violation. That's against a rules. rules. Vi yeah. But okay, I'm saying that's but, a rules violation as opposed yeah. to you're not saying, Hey, I'm going to save time and not hook up my kill switch. Yeah. But if you get, a bunch of waypoints from a local. I think you should never fish Bassmasters again. Wow. Ever. Ever. I mean, if you could you imagine if people started getting 86? Like there would be a lot less cheating going on. But I don't think there's a whole ton in our league, but um, you know, I and like I'm not involved in the other ones, but I hear terrible things going on in other leagues. Um but I, I just think all of them together, regardless of the league, I mean, if they, some of them can't because they got, you know, their old poster child's doing it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like the old, man, I don't know how, how much I can say here, but, you know, there used to be a guy that fished the FLW tour who, was, who Bill Taylor had his back pretty well and could do anything he wants. And, uh, you know, he took full advantage of that. And, uh, now I think you got kind of a similar situation at the other one where, you know, they got their poster child kind of do whatever he wants. But, um, yeah, I think if guys were 86 or maybe suspended for a year, or some form of serious punishment other than just being DQ'd for one event, it would, it would keep a lot of that down from happening. And you know, 99% of your guys are right as rain. Yeah. It's like any, anything you got, you got a couple guys that are, you know, will blatantly break rules out of whatever it may be, desperation or ego or, or whatever it is. And then, you know, you got some guys that kind of just look for gray areas, you know, they're trying to find loopholes, you know, they're like a good accountant, um, saving you money on your taxes, but this is a kind of a different game where I think it, it should be more black and white. And, and you, you know, what the, tension of the rule is those guys that look for the gray area they know the meaning behind the rule and then they just try to look for it being worded differently so then they can then they can break the rule and that's just that's just some dirty shit um i just wish there was more morals and i wish um but you know everybody wants a success they're not willing they're willing to trade morals for success and I think if we like if we started 86 and people when they got caught or whatever is more serious punishment. And I'm not saying just bass masters, but um the other organizations, if we started, you know, axing guys, I think you'd have a lot more well behaved crew. I I mean, I think that's proven worldwide. I mean, we're places where people chop their hands off hand for, for stealing. Yeah. <laughs> they don't exactly. steal very much. <laughs> you only got one hand left, you better not steal nothing. <laughs> And if you, dude, if you walk into a store with one hand in one of those places, you will, you think, 
You think oh, you've yeah. been profiled? Imagine how they look at you when you walk in with one hand. I mean, clearly. <laughs> it. Um, so I agree with that, that, that if things, if the penalty was bigger, you'd see less. I, I don't think we see a lot at the top levels, but I think it's also like people have to choose what they, there's a weird time in the world where people celebrate. There's some people who celebrate the gray. You know what I mean? Like you'll see people in other sports be like, wow, I, I, I feel very the disrespectful limits. to the game at love. I think it's super disrespectful. Like I don't like any of them guys that live in the gray. They're disrespecting the sport I love. You know what I mean? They know the intention of the rule. They're just trying to, I don't know what it is, you know, but like with the other organization, like they don't even want to tell you anybody cheated. I mean, they got stuff going on over there and dudes getting punished for it, but they won't tell you about it because they don't want a press release about it. Like, why? Like, why isn't that? You know what I mean? It's like the, with the Jeff Sprague thing with the, and the info and stuff. And, like, I don't even have as big a problem with that as I do him snagging him off a of bed. But, um, like, the Internet's the only reason he got in trouble. Yeah, and, they're all, you know, the whole reason – any of it even came to light was because uh, it got spread on the internet. They had known that information for three months prior um, to the whole thing happening, and it got leaked on the internet. The internet did its job for once, and um, that's the only reason he got DQ'd was a uh, public outcry. It's just so much of the stuff that happens over there gets buried, and um, I mean, I guess maybe they don't like writing press releases or what, or don't want to... <laughs> shine a bad light on their anglers but uh um I, I wish it stuff was more transparent people got to see what was really happening rather than everything getting swept under the rug you know do you, do you think that's the case and not just one league but do you think would you like to see all violations of any sort publicized like if if somebody gets hey they get 30 minutes in the penalty box because they forgot to put their life jacket on when they were close to a dam or something like you know, even yeah, violations like that. I think they should, as long as they're explained well enough yeah. and, and not just left real blank and open-ended. I mean, a lot of the stuff people get in trouble for it. I don't have a problem with, you know, it's, you know, not gaining a competitive edge and I don't feel like it's disrespectful to the sport. You know what I mean? Like little accents going too fast for a no way. You know, no kill switch hooked up, stuff like that. That doesn't bother me, but, you know, getting information or, um, you know, snagging fish off beds, I, I have a problem with that. I think you should be done after that. That's not an accident, you know what I mean? Like, you can forget to hook your kill switch up. You can't accidentally snag one off a bed and then unhook it two foot under the water and pull it in like nothing happened, you know what I mean? Just to be clear, my laughter is not at the situation. My laughter is the openness and honesty of our guest test fighter. And dude, I mean, you're, you're not wrong in a lot of situations. <laughs> How much feedback did I you get be, when, when you said you spragged that thought, fish? Everybody loved it. <laughs> yeah, the boys were going nuts. I, I mean... That 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 was one of those moments that caught the internet on fire. You've had a bunch of those. Yeah, the boys were buzzing, no doubt. Do you do you <laughs> I mean I think we've hit most things, haven't we? Really? We've kind of covered the, the world yeah. competitive fishing, but but it's good still, right? Like there's goodness. Yeah, oh world. yeah. No, there is. There's absolutely there's a a ton of guys out there I respect beyond imagine and um i still love the hell out of this game and there's a lot of guys out there doing it the right way and playing it the way it was made to be played and you know you got a few bad apples but i don't know why we keep letting them get away with it you know why do we need them there 86 of them they don't respect the game i promise you there's a new 25 year old that's just as good and 10 times hungrier that'll gladly take his place how do you keep – do you think that will be a problem moving forward with the younger anglers? I, I do. I, I know quite a few guys that fished college, and it sounds like there's a lot of hooligans running around in the college leagues. The Wild West. 
Yeah, it is. So <laughs> until those guys, you know, get in some form of trouble, I don't think they're going to stop doing what they're doing. And, you know, I never fished college. So, I mean, a lot of it's rumors and what have you, but I got enough friends that fish college and the, you know, there seems to be common themes going on with a lot of the, um, I shouldn't say a lot of them, but some kids coming out yeah. of college, they're, they're pulling the same shit and they've been doing it. And a lot of them are, you know, they're getting taught this in high school by guys that have no business teaching the sport of bass fishing, but you don't have enough people that know how to teach it, that are willing to teach it, to do it. So you get a lot of hooligans in there and then they're teaching these kids how to do it. And, um, it's just kind of running wild, but, uh, um, I think if we, you know, hang a couple witches in the town square, it'll, it'll, uh, straighten a few guys up. I think. Hang a couple of witches in the town square. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I put, hear you. Put them I hear you. in the electric chair. I don't know how to word it. I mean, uh, no, it makes sense. His hand off, whatever you want to call it. I mean, some and crack the whip you know yeah no i hear you it, and it it's um it's weird because i think in the high school end of things i think people just don't th think they're hurting you know what i yeah, mean like no, i do think there's a lot of yeah. people that are like hey y'all you know and i hear from people and they're like hey my kid he does we've never been here you know can, yeah. can you help us out and you know I respond to a lot of those and I'm like, you're not helping. Like you're not helping you. And I know they think that I'm just being a dick. Yeah. He just oh, doesn't yeah. want to give me spots, but it becomes a thing where it, you've done it through high school. You did it through college. Yeah. And next thing you know, you're trying to qualify for the elite series. And there's 175 pirates that are, <laughs> that are fighting to get those nine spots and uh, stuff gets exposed. Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to the same, like we don't have the right people teaching the sport, you know what I mean? And that's not any fault of their own. Like, you know, if you're raising, you got a couple boys and you know nothing about fishing and they get into high school fishing, you don't know no better, you know, yeah. you don't know what you're doing is wrong, but there ain't enough of the right people to go around teaching them, you know, but it is what it is. It'll all get, I mean, it's just the way the sport's changing. And, and I think that that being said, in the defense of the sport, it's so different than other sports. Like, think about, like, dude, you, in golf, you got a guy that walks beside you and recommends clubs and tells you how far it is and tells you what your average drive is with that club. And so if you don't, if you didn't grow up loving the sport like I did, like you did, you know, learning it the old school way, a lot of the stuff that happens, I mean, it isn't frowned upon in other sports. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it, it, I mean, sure. There's somebody that helps these guys. I mean, there's somebody yeah. helps golf first and, it, no doubt. but in fishing it's, uh, so is fishing more of a gentleman's sport? Is that what you say? Like, would you, I mean, I, I mean that's just my view on it. I, I, maybe I'm more of a purist, but, um, you know, I just, grew up absolutely in love with it and how it was done and um you know kids aren't you know what they're looking at ain't the same thing i'm looking at either you know what i mean you could take your 12 year old kid right now he's his idol's jacob wheeler you know what i mean he's gonna want to play the game jacob wheeler does living in the grave when whatever whatever he does um i grew up my idol was denny brower you know we're not the same like the people they're looking up to ain't this, you know what I mean? I don't yeah. know how else to put it, but like, no, I, I wanted yeah. to be Denny Brower, take no shit, play the game the may, way it was made to play, do your own thing, catch your own fish. And, you know, now the kids are just, I mean, the kids are looking up to are fish 20 yards away from somebody with a live scope, you know, it's yeah. different. I, I can tell I'm getting old, you know, <laughs> growing up Harvey, i just every year i just get uh more like my dad <laughs> <laughs> the more bristly that mustache becomes yeah, yeah. it's toughening up toughening up but yeah. you know but you can never ever you can never throw shade at anybody for 
wanting to do things right. I mean, you you've always, you know what I mean? Like the, yeah, but I think you're, you're gonna, doing. You're gonna have right. some, a lot more failures trying to do it that way. You know what I mean? There's a lot. We're gonna be a lot more easy success doing things. Uh, in my opinion, the wrong way. But who am I to say? You know. Yeah, but what happened the last time a bunch of people wanted to go for the easy route in this sport? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They died. They're ghosts. Wow. You can go see them at the graveyard. <laughs> Gosh. Wow. I mean, I, I thought for a while that Matt Robertson took all the... Nobody would think... Like, you were the quiet guy, but you've really come out here this evening, Seth. Yeah, well, th this evening, yeah. No, we started <laughs> this morning. We started this morning. I was just drinking a Coke. Now I'm on the claws. I mean, <laughs> people yeah. don't know how hard we work for this podcast, do they, Seth? Seth? Oh, yeah. No, this is a, quite the production. <laughs> quite the production. <laughs> Imagine having to cut it together. I mean, it has been a mess, but you have yep. not been. Um, thanks, dude. Thanks for doing this. It was a good conversation. I'm sure many people loved it. Some people didn't. Um, yeah, whatever. But maybe they'll like next week's show better. But I, I enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. See you soon. Oh, yeah. I'll come talk some shit again. All right. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> I'll see you, bud. <laughs> see you, dude. There you have it. The amazing fighter man, Seth, a fighter. And once again, I do apologize on some of the technical issues we had on this show. Um, and of course, the way it would be, it, it seems like every time when he just started flowing, like you're like, okay, here comes the juice. That's when it would freeze up. So it was incredibly frustrating for us both to have this conversation with getting broken up, but I hope we pieced it together well enough that it was an enjoyable episode for you guys because it was either this or just not put up an episode this week and i think if i've proven one thing to you i will we will we will go through some stuff to make sure we are here for you each and every wednesday but before i leave you this week i just want to say seth fighter prime example i talk about it all the time talked about it off the top of this show if you learn one thing from this show seth fighter is who seth fighter is and if you're an up-and-coming angler and this isn't just for fishing. This is just for life. Be who you are. I mean, we're all playing a role to a certain extent. But 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 the truth, you know, I mean, what I mean by that is like, it, it, take any job, any job you want. I mean, you're, you you become a police officer, you, you, you're playing a cop that day. But when you take that off, you're not a cop anymore, right? So we all have to play a spot in life. But the closer you can get to being the real you, the more successful you'll become. And I, I honestly believe the more at peace with yourself you will become. So be real, be you, and uh, hey, while we're at it, be here next Wednesday. <laughs> that was smooth, wasn't it? Enjoy being, have a great week, and as always, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like comment, and subscribe, because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?